Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining our session. Uh, I have a treat for you today. It's fascinating stuff. So I'm joined by Robert, uh, Robin Carhart Harris. He is the head of psychedelic research at Imperial College London, um, and he does a lot of studying on psychedelics. So uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have had alcohol in your life? <laughs> okay. How about weed? Okay, you can be brave. It's okay, we're a safe zone here. Um, magic mushrooms? There we go, okay. And um, LSD. Okay, all right. So by the end, I would like to see how many of you are intrigued to at least consider trying um, some of these psychedelics. We'll see uh, how good a job we do. So Robin, um, maybe we should start by just covering what the heck psychedelics are and um, what the word psychedelic even means. Sure, yeah. So. Psychedelics um, refers to a category of drugs. Um, some examples include LSD. That's the prototypical psychedelic in the sense that it was only after LSD was discovered in 1953 by Albert Hoffman uh, that there was a concerted effort uh, by scientists to, to try to study this category of compounds. And then the, the term was coined uh, some 10 years later by a British psychiatrist, Humphrey Osman. So what does psychedelic mean? Well, it means mind revealing, mind manifesting, making the mind, or, or more accurately, actually, the soul, psyche, visible. Uh, and that principal property is really at the core, I would argue, of why these compounds are interesting and also why they can be useful. So how do they work exactly, and what do they do to your brain? So we're still, you know, scratching the surface. There's a lot to discover, but we do know that they work on a particular neurotransmitter system in the brain, the serotonin system. People will have heard of serotonin and its association with mood, most likely. But it's also associated with a range of different things, modulating consciousness, sleep, uh, thinking, cognition. Um, and psychedelics work on this system in a particular way. They stimulate a particular receptor Serotonin is a particularly complex system. It has a, a very broad range of receptors, but there's this particular one, the serotonin 2A receptor subtype, which appears to be key to how these drugs work. If you block that receptor, people won't have a psychedelic trip. Uh, and, and what does this receptor do? Well, it seems to promote um, flexibility of mind and behavior, suppleness, sensitivity to context, and, and something that's referred to as plasticity, uh, not just neural plasticity, um, but plasticity in a, in a general sense. How do we define that? It, it's, it's the ability to change, essentially. So um, they, when you take a psychedelic, more of your brain connects with other parts of your brain? Yes, that's, that's part of it. So, so we now uh, can think better about brain function in, in, in cognitive neuroscience by thinking of brain networks. So those days of, of this region does this, that does something else, you know, that modular approach is kind of a bit old hat. So, so these days we tend to think of distributed systems and how they interact and such like. And what you see in the human brain, in brains in general actually, as they mature and develop is that systems become specialized. That's what you would expect. We become more finessed at different things that, that, that we can do. Um, and so these networks become more integrated within themselves and more segregated from each other. And that process seems to reverse temporarily under psychedelics, so the networks disintegrate temporarily, and they also desegregate. There's more of a global style of brain function. But um, psychedelics seem kind of scary. They have a bit of a negative perception and are illegal in many, many, many places. Um, so won't they cause you to maybe be more likely to commit suicide, have a psychotic break? Were they part of the, the Manson murders? <laughs> Gosh, well, there's a lot there. I mean, they are scary, and I think that's useful that people are scared of these drugs because they should be, in a sense, they should respect them. Uh, they're not party drugs. They're not things that you can take so freely like alcohol, or at least as people do. Um, uh, and so context is essential. Um, and so when we do our work, we carefully, first of all, screen people, prepare people for the experiences. We do them in a very controlled setting with mental health professionals. And we also do important integration work afterwards to help people make sense of things. So done in that context, it seems to be safe. It also seems actually to be beneficial. Um, and suicidality, um, some uh, 
population surveys have looked at this and have actually seen decreases in suicidality in people who've taken psychedelics recently. That might seem a shocking statistic, uh, uh, and it is. Um, and, and just to emphasize that, um, if you look at use of other drugs, more or less across the board, whether it's alcohol or, or, or you know, hard drugs and maybe cannabis as well, you, you'll see a, a, a negative relationship there. The more you take of those drugs, the worse your mental health, higher rates of suicidality. That trend is bucked by psychedelics. It goes in the other direction. Interesting. So no holes in your brain, nothing like no. that. You can't, you can't die from an overdose or something? Well, physiologically, it's very safe. I mean, if you were to die, it would, it would be through some accident uh, where you know, you've got yourself in trouble playing in traffic or something like that, which is why people should respect these compounds. Got it. So a lot of your research is centered around um, the potential benefits of something like a psychedelic on mental illness, depression, addiction. Um, so let's just cover how big a problem is mental illness? Can you put it in perspective for us? Well, it, it, it is huge um, in terms of the uh, socioeconomic burden. It's massive. Um, depression is estimated to, to be the leading cause of, 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 um, of burden. Uh, by 2030, I think it is, one in four people suffer from some mental illness, and yet there's likely under-reporting of that because of stigma, so it could even be more. Um, and then treatment, a lot of uh, people go under-treated because, again, of stigma. Um, and, and so, huge problem, and, and then, you know, questions uh, exist over whether the current treatments that we have and treatment strategies are really making the difference, because if prevalence isn't dropping, then we've got to look at um, ourselves in terms of people, you know, researching in, in psychiatry and, and, and say we're not, we're not doing uh, well enough here. And so talk a little bit about current antidepressant solutions. Where do they fall short and how do they work now? Yeah, so they, they seem to work on the serotonin system like psychedelics, but they work in a different way and, and so really, a major event in the development of antidepressants was the discovery of the selective serotonin reuptake in inhibitors in the 1980s. So these are Prozac-like drugs. And they still more or less dominate, really, and, and they're used not just in depression, but other disorders as well. And what they seem to do is they moderate stress, which can be helpful. Um, it can then help people cope. They seem to moderate the extremes of emotion. And so when one's emotion is extremely negative, then they, they will help to attenuate some of that. But then there's some questions over whether they're attenuating emotional range more broadly, and then questions over side effects, sexual dysfunction, um, uh, gastric problems, sleep problems. So you know, my feeling is that they're not the solution and, and that we can do better. And psychedelics, yes, they work on the serotonin system, but in a different way, rather than attenuating emotional range, they actually seem to release emotion and produce these emotional catharses, uh, that, uh, these, this emotional release that can be helpful for people. So talk about your research a bit. If I were one of your subjects, what would I expect? Well, we would, uh, first of all, talk to you on the phone and assess your eligibility. And we do have a very thorough screening process um, it's important that we do, I think. And, and then we invite you in and do a thorough screening. Um, this uh, assessment essentially can take up to three hours. We do baseline uh, um, recordings of different things, brain activity, brain function. Um, we do health checks, very thorough psychiatric interview. Um, and then as we move forward and it looks like you're eligible, we would do psychological preparation, building rapport, and this is especially so when we are um, uh, doing our research in a clinical population, in a vulnerable population, like in people with depression. And then we work towards the, the, um, the session itself, which is usually guided, um, which is how we, we word it. We have two therapists, um, uh, two mental health professionals that sit with the individuals throughout the day. And then we'll see them the next day, we see them the next week, and then we'll have a follow-up about a month later. And that's generally the structure to, to the research that we do. So um, what psychedelics are you giving to the subjects, and, and what does a trip even feel like? Well, it feels very strange. Some people uh, say it can be up there with the most uh, strangest uh, experiences of their lives. They can liken it to 
um, well, it's been likened to the near-death experience in terms of intensity, so pretty much about the extreme that it's possible for a human to, to experience in terms of an altered state of, of consciousness. People also liken it to being born. They can refer to it as, as a sort of rebirth experience. So, yes, uh, very, very strange. The perceptual side of, of it, which is often uh, emphasized, um, is, is in some ways somewhat superficial. Um, yes, there are geometric uh, patterns that might appear with your eyes closed, eyes open, you might see things sort of distorted. Eyes closed is really where the, the fun happens, so to speak, in that uh, people have very complex imagery. They can see very complex scenes playing out in their mind's eye. This isn't abstract like it can be when we close our eyes ordinarily and it's just our, our imagination. It's much more vivid and, and they can report um, sometimes what feel like actual reliving of, of um, events that they've experienced within their lives. They might be traumatic. Sometimes they're distorted in an interesting way, a bit like dreams where there's almost a uh, sort of um, replacement of what actually happened with some metaphorical representation. So, uh, you know, in the context of, 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 uh, of mental illness, for example, and, and traumatic abuse, the individual, and this has happened, um, might see the, their abuser, but represented in a sort of monstrous form. So, um, yes, very, very rich material and the emotional content that, that goes with the visions um, and, uh, and, and just the emotional intensity as well can be very profound. So this is just one experience um, can have, it seems like a somewhat lasting effect. And um, it's just fascinating. So why don't you go into a little bit of what you're finding when um, you give these subjects um, a, a four hour trip or, yeah, or longer? Yeah, it's, it's about four or five hours with psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms. And, and this, you know, is kind of a, a very strange uh, model in, in mental health care that a uh, time-limited experience, say four or five hours with your magic mushrooms, can have a, a lasting effect where weeks, months afterwards, even over a year, people are demonstrating um, significant changes. So they may well be changes in their mental health, um, better well-being, you know, lower severity on, on, on depression, if that's the indication that we're looking at. Uh, but also changes in personality as well. Trait openness seems to be increased in an enduring way with these, these compounds. But that possibility of having that time-limited experience, the drugs washed out of the body, yet the next day people are reporting a, a lightening of, of mood and, and, and profound insight that they've experienced under the drug, they often say they're still kind of integrating that information, and, and that, so the therapeutic support very much helps in that regard. The integration work, I can't emphasize how important that is in terms of grounding people. Um, but yes, so that rapid and in, enduring uh, uh, improvement that we can see is, is really what marks this out as something that potentially is quite special. And talk about um, some of the numbers. Like, what percentage of people are you seeing? I know the studies are still small, but what percentage of people are you seeing with um, mental illnesses and depression be somewhat cured by this long term, yeah. short term? Well, well, the cure term is is one that people like to use, but it, it you know it's a bit slightly dangerous one. But um, we can look at remission, um, uh, which we do. And so, in our depression trial, where we treated people with treatment-resistant depression. Um, most of them um, had uh, uh, severe depression at baseline. The other two of, of 20 had moderate uh, depression. But then the duration was, was very long. The average was about 18 years um, for the dur duration that they, they reported having been um, uh, depressed. And then at uh, about one month post-treatment, we had 50% in remission. And remember, these are people who had tried, in a couple of cases, 11 different antidepressant medications. Virtually everyone had tried psychotherapy. Nothing was budging their depression. And we got half, um, more or less well, um, at uh, three to four weeks post-treatment. Um, the caveat is that this particular trial was open label, so people knew what they were getting. And so now critical questions are, how much of this is, is the drug? How much of it's the therapy? 
our assumption is that there's a special synergy that happens between the suppleness of mind and sensitivity of, of mind uh, that, 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 that the drug induces and then the therapeutic support that we provide. It's very much uh, a combination hybrid uh, uh, treatment model. And are the effects similar for people who suffer from addiction? Yeah, they are. And, and so our trial was, was open label, but other uh, what we call double blind randomized control trials have been done that have placebo controls and better than that. They have active placebos where people get some drugs in interest, the psychedelic. Uh, results as well. You have Matt Johnson at, at John Hopkins. He did a, a great study looking at um, smoking addiction and had 80% uh, ab abstinence rates at six months after two treatment sessions with psilocybin. Uh, alcohol addiction, Michael Bogan shoots, um, doing great work there. There's a history of looking at alcohol um, dependence and psychedelic treatments for it that have been uh, what we call meta-analyzed, reviewed, you know, looking back in, in time, and, and, and they, the, the data does look very promising um, uh, in retrospect. Um, so yes, addictions, uh, small trial looking at obsessive compulsive disorder, we want to look at eating disorders. So any disorders, and this covers a lot of, of, of mental disorder, but where there, there are habits, and those might be habits of thinking, so in depression, negative thinking, um, about self, about the world. But in addiction, the habits are more obvious, you know, uh, uh, being um, uh, attached to some uh, object of, of reward or relief. Uh, and then OCD, the compulsions, obsessive compulsive disorder, the compulsions that, that uh, comprise that, that particular disorder. So, you know, th there seems to be something that happens in the mind when people suffer and, and feel uncertainty and anxiety or experience trauma that they try and kind of stitch up the world, you know, tie up that uncertainty and, and, and then that often manifests in these, these symptoms. And what psychedelics seem to do is that they, they, they re relax uh, these habits and, and, and the, the models on which they rest and, and then through that relaxation with the right kind of support, we can revise those, those habits and try and put people on a healthier trajectory. And one other thing that you've found is a correlation between psychedelics and becoming a liberal. Yes, so that's, that's a curious one, isn't it? Dangerous yeah. one. But uh, the reason to look there was um, based on the personality changes that we were seeing. And so it's, it, it's quite well established that psychedelics seem to promote this particular personality trait of openness. And then I discovered that openness is the most reliable personality trait with a political perspective. It's liberalism. So the question was asked, you know, why don't we look at liberalism and see if there are changes? And we saw them. And so now we're kind of drilling down a little bit more about you know, whether it, it's liberalism per se that's promoted or... Uh, uh, um, Sounds even more dangerous, but an anti-authoritarianism mm. seems to be an, an openness that is that comes with a questioning mindset. Um, I think something that's less um, sort of polarizing and, and dangerous in some sense, and is more obviously positive, is that we've also looked at uh, people's uh, uh, relationship to nature, how how close or connected they feel to nature. There are various scales of, of this, and we've seen that that's uh, significantly increased with um, exposure to psychedelics. We've got a number of, of different approaches, different analyses that are backing that up now. Um, other studies as well, other teams showing this. So, you know, given the current state of affairs that we're in, where, you know, it, it, it's so frightening and serious, um, there's something curious to consider here. I think. So it sounds like uh, maybe we could solve a bunch of our divisive issues if we just gave everybody some uh, magic mushrooms. Well, you know, scientists are meant to be apolitical, so I'll just <laughs> leave it there. It's for others to do the, the lobbying, perhaps. Fair enough. So um, you've studied Freud a lot. How does the ego play into all of this? Um, what do psychedelics do to your perception of yourself long term? Sure. So they do seem uh, to... Um, well, people use this term of ego dissolution or ego disintegration. It sounds very abstract, but uh, 
in some sense, it's more concrete than you'd think. I mean, how often do we use the personal pronoun I? You know, isn't it the most used word uh, uh, that we use in, in speech? And so we do have an assumption about ourselves. And, and, and in adulthood, we unconsciously assume that we've always been here. Um, but, if, you know, and, and have, have this almost absolute personality uh, that's fixed. And, and personality does seem to be quite fixed in, in adulthood. That's why the changes in openness are so curious. But uh, what psychedelics seem to do is they, they induce a state of consciousness where uh, the um, content of consciousness and the level of awareness or, um, or wakefulness is in no way diminished. In fact, content might be enriched. Uh, but people inhabit a state of consciousness where they don't experience things through this, this ego tunnel, through this lens of, of this is me, I'm here and, and the world's out there and all the investment that comes with ego and defense and, and uh, hubris and such like. Um, but there's a, an ability to step outside of oneself and almost um, see oneself as an other would with a degree of objectivity. Um, you know, and this state of, of sort of egolessness, if it's, if it's entirely achieved, is, is in, in some ways um, comparable to the perhaps to the state of consciousness that an infant inhabits. Again, you know, fully awake, <laughs> content-rich most likely, very supple, very sensitive, um, but, uh, but not necessarily inhabiting the world through this ego tunnel where, you know, they know who they are and all the stories that they tell about themselves and others tell about them have become fixed in this model of who they are and this assumption that they're absolute and will always be around, you know. All of that shattered. And actually, probably the, the, the shattering of, of that um, illusion uh, might be why um, psychedelics can also be useful in end-of-life care, where people realize that they're part of something bigger. You know, they aren't so invested in them as an individual ego and just see the process of dying as something inevitable and a sort of, you know... Uh, merging with, with everything else. And, and it's, because of that, it's less frightening, and they see that bigger picture, and, and um, it provides some relief. What's so amazing that it, it seems like just four hours of your mind in this different place can change your life. Um, and people have said, if I'm correct, that they compare a trip sometimes to the birth of a first child being that transformational um, to one of the most spiritual moments of their entire life. Uh, but why, why is that? Is it just the ego dissolving like you were saying? Um, well, of course, this can happen you know, in terms of uh, short-lived experiences having long-term uh, effects, but usually we think of it in the negative direction in terms of trauma, how trauma can change your life. Mm. But uh, here uh, we're having the, this kind of insight-based experience, this overview-like experience. And uh, the analogy there isn't um, unintentional. It's very analogous to the, the overview effect that astronauts have, have famously reported when they've had that privilege of seeing the whole of the Earth and how that profoundly affects them. And so it's, it's that ability to see the big picture that is probably at the essence of why people describe this as a spiritual experience. If you drill down into the psychology of the spiritual experience, you'll see that sense of interconnectedness, that sense of oneness, uh, being very much at the core of a spiritual experience. And here with psychedelics, if we do this right, you know, we have an amazing opportunity to, I, I would argue, naturalize that phenomenon, understand its basis in this thing of nature that's in our skulls, our, our brains, uh, and, um, and then appreciate, you know, the wonder of, of all of that. And um, it's a very grounding thing, and, and, and I think it's something, if, if, if fully appreciated, can be about a kind of uh, broadening of awareness, of consciousness, a kind of awakening uh, in some sense. So... I'm hearing a lot of good things. Are there any negatives that your studies have shown? Anything we should be wary of? There's definitely things that we should be wary of. And, and the first one to emphasize is, um, you know, kids don't try this at home kind of message, really. Um, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to, um, you know, 
promote uh, use of psychedelics because there are such important caveats, such as um, people taking them in the right context, the importance of the prep preparatory work and the integration work. Um, and so the worries, uh, the concerns are over people doing this irresponsibly, recklessly, as they often do, you know, at music festivals, this kind of thing, or they have a psychiatric vulnerability uh, around psychosis and they have some kind of psychotic break. Very rare, it seems, looking at the data, but it does happen. We do have to take it seriously. In our um, modern research, we screen very carefully for vulnerabilities for psychosis. We don't treat bipolar disorder. Um, so um, uh, a lot of things to, to be cautious of there. Um, and, and also, it's worth saying, despite you know, psychedelics in some sense having a much older um, empirical base than something like SSRIs, in that plant-based psychedelics have been used for likely thousands of years, um, but still, you know, given modern medicine and science, there may be things that, that we don't know. Um, so it seems physiologically very safe, but uh, let's keep an open mind here. Um, looks good so far, but um, yeah, there's uh, just got to keep our feet on the ground, I think. So what's needed to make um, your psychedelic research more um, conclusive, more widespread, uh, and how far out do you think we are from making psychedelics more mainstream and maybe mainstream accepted? Yeah. Well, things are, are progressing well. You have the major institutions showing interest now in, in this area. Yale are coming in and, and, and uh, the University of Oxford. Um, and so... Um, yeah, it's progressing well in, in, in the sense of mainstream academia. We're often invited to talk at, at the main events and just waiting now really for the, the funding uh, to come in as well. Um, uh, but the investment is coming in. And that's in, interesting that, that often maybe it's commerce that's sort of leading the way in terms of being visionary. Um, uh, and so, so there are a couple of companies uh, that are coming into this domain who are investing in the development of psilocybin as a medicine. The focus is on treatment-resistant depression and ambitious efforts to try and get this to marketing authorization within a time frame of about um, most ambitious estimates of within five years, whether or not that will be achieved. Let's wait and see. But... Um, but the, you know, the required numbers and, and rigor of science that's needed to take this to, to marketing authorization is coming. And, and, and also the regulators are on side. So this is really critical. So the FDA have given breakthrough therapy designation to psilocybin for depression, uh, the research efforts there. Um, the, the European uh, Medicines Agency are also on board having very positive discussions with with different organizations trying to drive the development. So the, uh, the climate's looking good. Um, so let's, let's hope it develops in, in the right way. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. OK, um, well, I'd like to open it up. Does anyone have any questions? We have time for a few. There's one in the back. Hi, yes. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the guided sessions, I mean, or the um, test subjects being observed? Or are they being given questions? Or are they hooked up to anything? And just what those sessions look like? Sure. So one thing to really emphasize, we, we've worded it as the, the hidden therapist. And, and what's that? Um, because generally, this, the, the therapist's approach, or the guide's approach, is quite hands off. Um, uh, they're not asking questions. Um, we don't hook them up to anything in terms of you know, brain imaging or anything like that. Uh, the emphasis is on an inner journey um, and what might be discovered uh, in that space. Um, but the hidden therapist is music. Um, and so uh, it would be wrong to, to think that, there's, that, that this process within the session is entirely undirect, undirected or undirectional because the music is quite directional starts off very um, spacious and atmospheric and it builds, it becomes more emotionally evocative. And, and in some sense it is, it, it, manipulating might not be the right word, but it's coaxing uh, an emotional experience, an emotional release. Uh, and, and the insight seems to, to come with that. Yeah. Maybe time for one more here in the front. 
and um, how successful it's been. And it, there was a peak in the press, and now it's kind of tapered out. Yeah. Microdosing is this fascinating phenomenon. It's, it's about taking very small doses of a psychedelic like LSD um, that are more or less sub-perceptible. Uh, and then people talk about going about their, their, their daily life. Uh, um, uh, but with a, a heightened sense of well-being and perhaps a more um, creative mind, mindset. So it's, it's all very interesting and it's plausible, um, but the caveat there is that there's very little published on it. Uh, and so it, it's this meme that's been created around people who've, who've done it and talked about it and journalists have written about it. In terms of the, the, the hard science, I've got to say it's not there yet. Um, so that's a little reminder that things can, you know, the world can get carried away with a phenomenon. Um, and uh, and I, let, let's wait and see. It does make sense. Theoretically, it makes sense that even a low dose can work on the serotonin system in a particular way to kind of lubricate the mind, uh, free things up. Um, but uh, we, we've got to do the, the hard science still. <laughs> we, we, we're looking into it, and others are as well. And there are a couple of surveys that are published. We've done a survey. Um, the survey actually suggested um, that there's something in, in the acute effects that are, that are noticeable um, that seems to um, predict the improvements in, in well-being that you see. My sense is that they're probably more reliable, these improvements in well-being are more reliable than any cognitive enhancements. Um, because... My sense is that what you gain in terms of flexibility of mind, you probably lose in terms of focus. So. Okay. Um, well, you can find Robin after. Um, thank you all so much for joining us, and hopefully it uh, opened your mind up a little bit. Thank you.